Hey everyone, welcome to this new video. Today, we're gonna to tackle the topic of CO2 tolerance. All right, Andrew, what is CO2 tolerance? Uh, in simple terms, it is the ability of the body to tolerate higher or lower levels of CO2 than the normal range. Mm -hmm. So in a previous video, we touched on breathing basics and, and CO2. So CO2 accumulates in the body as a result of the breakdown of uh, sugars and fats. And so as intensity of the activity, the intensity of the activity increases, we're going to produce more and more CO2. So this is where CO2 tolerance uh, becomes interesting. Can you give us maybe as a reference point, some, uh, what are normal levels of, of CO2? And then what, what's the range that we might be looking at, um, both in, both in exercise, but also maybe in a medical setting just to get the, the widest range possible. Yeah. So, um, like we talked about before, the CO2 is very tightly regulated because, uh, the body uses CO2 as a, um, byproduct to help modulate pH in the body. So, the pH in the body is tightly regulated between 7.35 and 7.45. And anything outside of those ranges is truly a physiologic emergency. The body does not tolerate it well. Uh, enzymes start to shut down. Um, processes start, start to decouple. And, and, and really, um, we use a, a low pH uh, in a medical setting as a, as a clear indicator of uh, near death experiences or whether, whether somebody is, is in acute distress that needs to be resuscitated. Mm -hmm. Um, and we actually use pH, um, to see if our resuscitative efforts, uh, are actually working. Okay. The CO2 is because it's so tightly related to pH is also, uh, a, an important number that, that is tightly regulated by the body and held, um, very tightly between, uh, 35 and 45 millimeters of mercury is a partial pressure. Mm. Uh, we measure it as a partial pressure um, in the blood, uh, either by doing arterial blood samples. In a healthy person with healthy lungs, the end tidal CO2 or the amount of CO2 they blow off is very closely associated because CO2 um, transfers across membranes very easily. So the amount of CO2 that's measured in an exhaled breath is very closely associated with the amount of um, CO2 that's being brought back through the lungs for reoxygenation. Uh, so as a venous CO2 measurement, uh, the entire CO2 closely approximates that. So that's our, that's our average value now that's, if we look at extreme value. healthy. Yeah. So uh, in unhealthy patients, so these are people, so that typical places where we see CO2 rising is someone whose lungs aren't working properly. They either have a, a disease process like COPD or asthma or lung damage from a toxic injury. Um, the ability to, for that CO2 to cross those membranes is impaired. So we'll see higher levels of CO2 above that 45. Uh, and in chronic smokers, we see it up into the 50s. Um, in someone who's brains being affected. So now they have the inability to breathe properly, either from a toxic drug ingestion or coma, head injury, things like that. Um, or uh, there are other impediments to them breathing, the spinal cord injury or something like that. We see CO2s continuing to climb beyond the 60s, even in the 70s and 80s. And someone who's hypoventilated or has been intubated but not ventilated properly, we we can see numbers in, in the 80s, 90s. Uh, these are life-altering life events for these people and, and not survivable. And mm. uh, every medical um, intervention is meant to bring those CO2 levels back down towards that normal range of the 35 to 45. And we use those numbers from arterial blood gases to actually affect our medical response to those people and adjust accordingly. So we really aim for normal physiologic CO2 levels when we're ventilating patients that we've, uh, that we've resuscitated. Um, interestingly enough, uh, we're talking about uh, outside of normal CO2 ranges. We were looking up uh, some numbers on uh, tested free divers uh, who have obviously an incredible ability to tolerate CO2 um, when they're underwater and, and their long breath holds. But eat, the numbers that I could see, I couldn't find numbers showing end tidal CO2s of much higher than the mid fifties. Mm. So um, it just shows that if you have a working brain, 
that is responding appropriately to physiologic stress, you will be forced to breathe before your numbers go much higher than uh, even in the elite free divers with, with breath holds of five minutes, their, their CO2s weren't climbing above the 50s. Mm. Um, they did, however, show an incredible tolerance for low CO2. So hyperventilating their CO2 off before they start their dive. Uh, and anybody who's tried hyperventilating knows that they start to feel very dizzy very quickly. You take three or four deep, fast breaths, you'll get dizzy very quickly. And that's because your, your um, intracranial pressure is tightly related to CO2 as well, because uh, CO2 has an effect of, of vasodilation uh, in the brain, causes swelling. If you hyperventilate, you actually blow off the CO2, it vasoconstricts uh, and causes, it, it, it alarms your brain to, to breathe slower so that you don't pass out. Uh, anyway, they, they had uh, CO2s measured down in the uh, uh, CO2 partial pressures down in the 14, 13 and 14, which um, is astounding if you've ever tried it. If you blow your numbers, most average people, if you blow your numbers down below 35, you feel extremely uncomfortable very quickly. So, uh, so when we're talking CO2 tolerance, we're mostly talking about a tolerating a high CO2 for right. the physiologic benefits from sports, um, but blowing off CO2 requires a special kind of tolerance as well that free divers have a, a unique ability to do. That's that's really interesting. Um, how can we increase our tolerance to CO2? Yeah, so the the initial tolerance can happen actually quite quickly, and, and uh, it's been popularized in books uh, like The Oxygen Advantage. Uh, which shows benefits to doing uh, prolonged breath holds or or different breathing patterns and allowing a lower ventilation than you would typically um, uh, do at, at rest. Uh, there, so there are there's a lot there's as many techniques as as there are ways there, but but all of the techniques are meant to slow your breathing down and reduce both respiratory frequency and tidal volumes to allow the carbon dioxide to build up in the body and allow the body to get used to it. The, the, there's two places where there's two areas where the, the carbon dioxide is measured in the body. Uh, there's peripheral sensors in the carotid body and in the aortic uh, mm. arch. Uh, those are measuring changes to um, pH and, are, and send signals through the glossopharyngeal nerve up to the brain to tell it to breathe faster. Um, there's also chemoreceptors in the brain that are exquisitely sensitive to CO2, and CO2 crosses the blood-brain barrier. They're less sensitive to pH, partly because um, hydrogen ions don't cross the blood-brain barrier Interesting. Uh, as easily or at all. So the CO2 levels are, t are closely related. So when your CO2 starts to climb towards that high normal range, it's firing messages in the brain of of wanting to increase your ventilation. That's what drives you to want to breathe. Uh, so by exposing the brain to higher levels of CO2, it, your brain readapts and resets that set point. Mm -hmm. And like many other things, like a, like a temperature set point and things that people have, you can, you can trick the body by training it daily by tolerating higher levels of CO2. Um, and like I mentioned before, that your, our smokers who are who most have um, lung disease from the smoking after chronic smoking um, have much higher levels of CO2 tolerance because they have over the years and every day have have exposed their brains to higher levels of CO2. And we see that in their resting um, blood gases. Uh, so it can be done uh, with just a few minutes a day, five to 10 minutes a day of slower breathing or patterned breathing. There's box patterns, there's breath hold patterns, uh, and all of those things are meant to reset that set point to a higher level, to tolerate higher levels of CO2, and then the physiologic effects that go along with that. Um, yeah, there's some other advanced techniques that maybe we'll take over, we'll, we'll talk about in the future things, but all of these uh, ideas of whether you're practicing breath holds or CO2 tolerance, it's, it's a good reminder just to be safe. You shouldn't be done in air, any areas where you're potentially at danger, driving a car or in a dangerous situation, and specifically the ones that, that uh, are have some tragic outcomes or are in pools or around water, mm -hmm. uh, because there is, there's always the ability to, um, for your brain to, 
to to shut down momentarily and and cause you to pass out and if you pass out in, in an area of danger then obviously that puts your, your whole life at risk and so we do, we do advise people to be somewhere safe and to only do it to a level that is tolerable and and not take any additional risks yeah for maybe for people who are familiar with uh something that's pretty popular nowadays wim hof uh techniques for example they always tell you to lie down don't be sitting on a chair because you could fall off the chair hit your head i mean you want to be safe like you said that's that's a very important thing. Uh, we talked about the benefits of higher levels of CO2 in another video that we did on the topic. Now, are there any potential downsides to increasing our CO2 tolerance? Um, uh, increasing tolerance to a moderate to degree, I, I, I don't see any strong negative effects. Uh, if you, uh, if you, there are negative effects to having CO2 in, a, in medical situations, and those are things that we're, we're trying to overcome. So mm -hmm. higher CO2s lead to higher heart rates. They lead to the desire to breathe more, and so they cause a feeling of shortness of breath. Mm -hmm. um, they cause flushed skin, but they can cause, it can cause confusion. Headaches and dizziness are the, are, the, are the main ones, and that's the acute phase reactions to high CO2s. So as soon as you start breathing normally again, those effects should all equilibrate and come back to a normal level. Um, if you have any sort of prolonged symptoms from the breath holding exercises, then really what you've done is, is you've done some level of, of damage to the system. Uh, and I think that would only take place if you were really pushing your system beyond what, what, what most people consider a reasonable amount of discomfort. We never want to push that feeling of shortness of breath or the air hunger that people talk about beyond just a, a moderate level. There's, there's not a strong uh, evidence of benefiting beyond a, a moderate amount of air hunger. It's good to practice that. There, is some, there are some strong benefits to doing those things, um, both physiologically and mentally, uh, doing slow breathing, but anything pushing past to an extreme level, there's always gonna be that the downsides of, of prolonged damage. All right. Well, Andrew, that was great uh, for everybody. Go do your breath holds, but do them safely. As we said, um, make sure you drop us a like, a comment below. If you have any uh, follow-up questions on this topic or any other topic you would like to see us cover in this video series, um, I guess we'll see you guys in the next video. Take care, guys.